Today on the Grandland Video Blog, Dark Avengers. Guardians of the Galaxy. Amazing Spider-Man and Spider-Man Noir. Welcome to the Grandland video blog for books that came out on February 18th, 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 February 18th, 2009. As always, I'm Craig, your host. This is the first of three installments this week. We're going to talk about some Marvel books here. Part two, we'll have some DC and some indie stuff. And then in part three, I'm going to take a special look at some more Marvel books, all X titles that came out this week. Figured since there's four of them, we'll clump them all together into a single uh, review separate from this one. But first, let's start with the non-X-Men areas. Dark Avengers number two. This is turning out to be a really, really fun book. Mike Deodato's art obviously comes over from the Thunderbolts, and, uh, you know, that's kind of the idea of this team. They've kind of supplanted the Thunderbolts as crazy bad guys posing as good guys. Um, there was a lot less setup here, and, and it was really kind of surprising to see that. We saw in the first issue there was a lot of setup. It was all this buildup and you know, going on about how the team gets assembled, and now we're right into it. Bendis is really learning how to uh, tackle these issues and actually give us some you know, action now and then instead of nine panels of talking heads, which, hey, you know, it, Bendis made his millions on it, but at the same time, it's nice to see a change of pace. Uh, Morgan Le Fay shows up and attacks Dr. Doom, and you know, the Avengers are like, oh, well, we can go take care of that, I guess. I don't know if we necessarily want to take care of that as our first thing. And it's an amazing fight with a bunch of holy crap moments, you know. It's really exciting. Deodato draws the pants right off of the scenes. And Bendis writes it amazingly, you know, with snappy dialogue, not heavy dialogue. But just enough dialogue to make it work right. And you're sitting there going, whoa, and you're laughing. And it'll make you laugh. It'll make you cry. It'll make you scream. It's a thrill ride. It's a really fun book. It's exactly uh, what the Avengers franchise is supposed to mean, except for with bad guys, which is, of course, the twist. But, you know, if you can get past that, if you don't mind that, you know, if you go in with a negative mindset and you say, oh, here we go, Bendis has his hands in the Thunderbolts and he's got to put the Avengers name on him and, you know, I'm going to be a negative internet Nancy and blah, 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 then, yeah, you're not going to like this book. But if you're looking for a fun Marvel book, you know, like I said, with classic Avengers feel action of just like crazy things going on, you know, just stuff flying all over, people dying, but they're not dead. And then all of a sudden, three pages later, they're like, hey, guess what? I'm not dead. That's, that's really fun. I mean, that's, that's what comics are at their heart and soul. And that you can tell Bendis is just having a great time doing this book. Uh, it's great. You know, get past the hype, get past all the dark rain, big event, you know, fatigue or whatever you want to call it. It's good stuff right there. Bottom line. Next up, Guardians of the Galaxy, number 10. It is amazing to me that this book continues to move forward in a, kind of a 90s feel almost of this uh, nebulous status quo as things go on. You know, who's on the team, who's not on the team, what's going on, what's going to happen. You know, uh, there's a lot of, you know, there's not a lot of sitting around going, okay, this is our team, we're going to go on this mission. Now our mission's done, we're going to sit back at our headquarters go on another mission, go back to the headquarters. There's not a lot of that in Guardians of the Galaxy. It's a lot of, holy crap, here's this stuff happening to us, and we're going to try to respond to it as best we can, and we're kind of you know, going through space, and we get out of that, and we're like, we just solved that. Oh, we're in a bigger problem. Abnett and Lanning have a great skill of, of keeping that momentum moving with cliffhangers, with various crazy items happening. You know, we did have a, a short break in the first, after the first story arc, which was nice, where the team broke up, and now you're seeing them come kind of back together. Uh, this is a nice wrap-up to the Negative Zone story. Uh, it, it is still sort of War of Kings related, and at the same time, not. So if you're really a completist and you need every War of Kings book, then yeah, you're reading this. But uh, if, you're, if you're looking for the stuff that's tied into War of Kings, don't be fooled by this logo here at the top and say, oh, I have to read this to know what's going on. You don't. We're going to talk about X-Men Kingbreaker by request in the uh, third part, but that's another issue where it's kind of like that, that means a little more in the War of Kings. It's a lot less peripheral than this book is. But still, this is still a really fun book, as I've said, for 10 months straight now. 
just read it already. It's great. Next up, The Amazing Spider-Man. And he is accused in number 587, part three of four on character assassination. Um, this is really losing some steam. And it's really sad. I, I don't know how uh, Blue Goblin feels about it, our resident Spider-Man expert on the other video blog over there. But uh, I'm curious to see what he's going to say about this because it's really, the first two parts were really fun. The interlude was kind of like, okay, it's an interlude. We're going to hold it to a lower standard and it met its lower standard, but it's not the first two parts. Part three, you have Spider-Man in jail. That's not too big of a spoiler, I guess, since he's in uh, cuffs and <laughs> right on the cover. Um, but the, the story just grinds to a halt. We almost see like a rehashing of Guggenheim's story from Amazing Spider-Man Extra number one, which actually fits in during this time with all of the extra Spider-Man in the courtroom, the really cute legal drama thing that Guggenheim brings to us from working on television for so long. But really the story just grinds down. You know, we found out who the spider tracer killer is. Uh, we found out who Menace is. We're about to find out who's winning the election. And it's just, just down. It's just, okay, these things all happen and then we're going, just slowing it out. And, and I think they're almost in a way writing themselves into a corner, but I, at the same time, you know, I, I trust the brain, tr brain trust. I trust Steve Wacker. He does a great job and he's a hilarious commentary man on Newsarama. If you go over there, he's answered some questions about it. Um, some really funny stuff, but it's just, uh, it's just tough. Like it's, it's just dying. It's, it's going very slowly. Lastly, for this installment, Spider-Man Noir number three. I've previously gone on record as saying I enjoy the X-Men Noir more than this one. And uh, it's also been a discussion here lately about where David Hine is taking the story with giving Spider-Man Noir some powers. You know, is that kind of a violation of the Noir franchise? I think, I think issue three was really the make or break and Hine made it uh, in, his, in his regular style. He made it. This is really well done. This is, it continues the feel it breaks itself away from just copycatting X-Men Noir. You know, it goes in a new direction while keeping the Noir vision, and it's, it fits. It fits very well with some crazy twists, and it's definitely, again, just like X-Men Noir 3, it's building towards a great climax, but it's doing it in its own unique way. And that is very important in this book. It's really good fun, you know, if you, if you haven't read the first two, I, I don't know. You, you're going to have trouble finding them. Wait for the trade, I guess, because they're. I think I don't even know if they're in second prints, but it's great. It's just, it's just a lot of fun in Spider-Man. You know, what if Spider-Man was in the Great Depression? That's really what it is, and it's handled so well. And again, I got to say, the Dennis Calero variants really make the noir line right now. There's just something about them all. You know, there's sharp black and whites and reds or the black and white and single color that just makes it feel so good just makes it a great book overall highly recommended a really good batch of books this week from marvel that's it for this installment we'll see you in part two with some dc and some indie books